uh, welcome everyone. So glad you could all be here with us and mm -hmm. share this time. And uh, already we've had a couple of sessions this morning. We had a session over at the other house and we had a session on, on pain and healing starting off at the breakfast table this morning. So it's like a continuous going into things. And uh, we've talked about different challenges and struggles that seem to come up on the spiritual journey and I think it's important to have an awareness of a basis that that there is an underlying fear of waking up that this this is a dream world but that the mind has become so accustomed to this dream world that now the dream has become so familiar that the dream seems like it's reality and that true reality or the light seems to be uh, a forgotten memory or something that's been completely pushed out of awareness. So that's part of, you could say, a context for why there seems to be so much fear when you're going through this waking up process. That, uh, that it's, it's like there's a terror of letting go of the familiar and this world has now become the familiar. So it's now the Holy Spirit has to turn turn the table, so to speak, and bring about a reversal. That's also why there's a fear to look within. That's why people report with meditation experiences that they were going deeper and deeper, and then they reached a state where they just got frightened by what they felt. It was, it was too unfamiliar, and they're too expansive, it felt so different. And uh, that's a context for understanding why there seems to be so much resistance to the light. When people say, I don't understand why I could, I could be afraid of love. Uh, this doesn't make any conscious sense. Why would I be afraid of love? But it's just that the mind that believes in the ego believes in an opposite to love. And therefore, the very thing which is love, which is reality, seems to become fearful. So, so there's going to be a bit of, of challenge and conflict and turbulence you know, as you go through the waking up process. But those times come and they go, you know, they pass, and you know, we say, this too shall pass. So, this weekend is a great opportunity to make things very, very practical. So, if you have specific things that are going on in your awareness, specific issues or topics you'd like to explore, that's why we're here. We've all we've come across the ocean to join with you and to just come together in a very practical way so you can ask any questions. Also, if you start to, to get a little bit of an idea of something but you wonder, you know, how does this, how do you put this into practical application? How does this apply in daily life? We love to talk about this thing. That's, we, we live in spiritual communion and spiritual community. Uh, the whole point is to be a living demonstration of peace and love and joy and not to just have a bunch of concepts where you talk about those things, but to actually have the experience in your heart. And so that's really why we're here, is to make it as practical as possible. And there are going to be times, you know, when you may think, hmm, I, sentimentally I agree with that, but I just don't, I don't really understand that. I think when you look at understanding, you know, we've all been raised going to schools and to you know, universities and so on and so forth. And we, we have equated intellectual understanding with understanding. And we might say that the spiritual understanding is really different from intellectual understanding. Spiritual understanding is a, is a deep, deep feeling of peace. And as I was sharing last night, that Jesus tells us that peace and understanding go together and cannot be found apart. He even goes further to say, think not that you understand what anything is for until you pass the test of perfect peace. And what he means by that is, until you come to a stable experience of peace of mind, then don't think you understand anything. It's better to be more like a little child and just say, I'm curious, uh, show me. <laughs> you know how children are always asking questions and saying, show me, then to pretend that you're a mature, functioning adult citizen mm -hmm. that actually understands how the whole thing works. Mm -hmm. Because that's actually the most arrogant stance that you could have. 
even though we're taught that we learn and learn and learn all the way through childhood, and then when we reach adulthood, we're supposed to have a, a grip on things. We're supposed to kind of have a grasp of how things work. And uh, we could say that spiritually speaking, we really don't have a very good grasp at all. And it just gets more humbling. The farther you go on the journey, the, it's like the less you think you know, and the more childlike you feel in terms of, uh, I think you even get more curious um, as you go along. Before you open up to a sense of certainty, you have to go through a stage where you're very curious and you're, you're willing to ask uh, the right questions. In fact, uh, I think, well, last time when we were here, did we show the movie uh, The Peaceful Warrior? Yeah. We showed that movie, and there's one scene in there where uh, Socrates, the teacher, is with Dan, and basically the teacher tells Dan, you need to, to learn to ask better questions, because I think he's, he's wanting to chase after this woman Joy, and as he's stuffing down all of his food, and the teacher is like, you need to ask better questions than this, you know, because he's asking, do you know her? Is she related to you? You know, he's trying to pick up a girl, and the teacher is like, uh, so, you might say that, that learning to ask the right questions symbolically would mean learning to ask questions about your mind, about your consciousness, about your perception, and learning to, to see that the way that you have seen things has not been very accurate, but that there is a better way, and you can ask good questions. Instead of saying, why, do, why are bad things happening to me, it could be more of like, what is it that I believe that I'm drawing this experience into my awareness? Uh, those are two different questions. One is looking outside as if there really are bad things out there that are happening to you, like coming at you. And the other assumes, oh, I have a belief, and this belief is bringing forth this experience. And I can question that belief. I don't, don't have to just continue to assume that that belief is true and just leave it tucked away down there in my mind, unquestioned. I can actually raise it up and start to see the folly of whatever the belief is. And there are many beliefs, that, but they all have one uh, tree trunk. I mean, there are many branches on the tree, but the trunk is always the ego. So the goal is to really get in touch with the trunk and see the nothingness or the meaninglessness of the trunk, and then all, all the branches and the leaves, which seem to be so complex, suddenly are up. It was all the same problem. It wasn't such a complicated mess after all. It was just, oh, it was an identity confusion. I forgot who I was, and I fell asleep, and I made up a real complicated uh, labyrinth and maze to try to keep myself asleep. And now I'm ready to wake up. I'm ready to, have, uh, to forgive and to wake up. So we have another day that doesn't have a lot of structure. I think Chucky was saying lunch will come whenever. 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 <laughs> That's pretty unstructured. <laughs> we'll have a whenever lunch and then dinner tonight. Is, we have a, about the same. About the same. 6 30, 47. Okay. And other than that, we it's pretty wide open. Uh, I think we do even have, have drapes that we can pull. So if we choose to watch a movie, um, I think we can still make it fairly dark in here. Just try it out. We have a lot of <coughs> good metaphysical movies here. So, we started right off this morning with <coughs> topics of healing and pain, but after our session yesterday on private thoughts and after our movie last night, is there any uh, things that got stirred up or any topics or issues that you feel like you'd like to explore in greater detail? I have a question. Um, in in the when we dream, there's always so it seems a lot is seen in, in when I dream. Mm -hmm. and I'm just wondering from the waking state and the dream state, because when you, when I wake up, then I, you know it's gone. I've forgotten it. Do you know if um, if it's revelations, whether they they stay with you if it's a dream? As the same, there is any difference between the waking state and the dream state as far as, you know, the taking on of that knowledge that I would have learned even though I've forgotten it? Yeah, you're talking about the, in the human life, the, the dream state at night and the waking state, the 
seems to be our daily mm -hmm. life and everything. And yeah, there's actual, actually no difference uh, whatsoever. So, uh, just like in nighttime dreams, you can get a lot of symbols that come in mm -hmm. and you can have a lot of very powerful experiences, both very either positive or mystical or very horrific and negative. It's the same with uh, what seems to be waking life. That that it's we could just say that all of what seems to be nighttime dreams and daytime dreams are just two aspects of perception that seem to be different but actually are identical. And uh, that's something that comes through in the Matrix where the teacher Morpheus says, what if you were in a dream that you could not wake from? Uh, how would you know what was the dream and what was real? And so to human beings and human experience it seems like that the nighttime dreams are just imagination. If you go to sleep and you have these sometimes a very active imagination and you get into the REM state and you go into these states of mind consciousness where you have all kinds of experiences and while you're dreaming them they seem very real. Uh, you don't doubt the reality of the dreams. You feel all the emotions whether you're being chased by a dragon or <laughs> falling off a cliff or whatever it seems to be. It's, you have all those emotions. And so in that sense, they're very much like the waking dreams of human beings, what they call their daily life, because they don't, again, they don't doubt uh, the reality of what they're perceiving. Usually if somebody would come up to you with a, pull out a gun or a knife, you know, the reactions that humans have are one of defensiveness and fear. Uh, we do have a movie in our collection where, though it's, there's someone who's given a, a, a task of, of what's called interactive theater. So he's, he believes that everything that's happening to him is part of a, an interactive theater called the Theater of Life, where it's just actors improvising and coming at you with scenes and you're supposed to improvise. So in that state of mind, they try to shoot him, strangle him, poison him, do all kinds of things to him. And he just laughs his way through the whole thing because he thinks it really is just a dream or it's just a, a theater. And you know, you can see how in our lives if we thought that way about uh, relationships, you know, you would never think of relationships as having a lot of drama if you if you were constantly aware that it was all play act. You know, it was just like a theater that they were acting out a part that was given. Instead of being autonomous human beings that have minds of their own and thoughts of their own and, and decision-making capabilities and memories and ambitions, you know, all the things that are thought to make up the human being as an autonomous individual, those are all part of the belief system of the ego. But it's just not seen that they're all just acting out uh, parts, like prearranged parts from a very ancient instant when all the parts were cast. Uh, and all of the characters, not no human being is really a whole person. It's almost like uh, there's a part in the Course where Jesus talks about the dream that you dream in secret and the dream that you gave away. Jesus makes a distinction. He's not making a distinction between what we call nighttime dreams and daytime dreams or active daily life. He's making a distinction between the dream that you dream in secret, which you might say is kind of like it's been called like the collective unconscious or the shadow that Jung called it, you know, it's this dark uh, feeling of, of unworthiness, of, of wrongness, of sin, of guilt. And that's the dream that you dream in secret. And then the dream that you gave away is what we perceive as the perceptual world, where it seems as if the dream is happening to us, or that the characters are interacting with us, uh, but we've forgotten the, the secret dream which is uh, that we're guilty. So in the dream that we gave away, it seems like sometimes we're guilty and sometimes we're not guilty. Sometimes we experience pleasure, sometimes pain, sometimes things seem to go our way, and sometimes things do not seem to go our way at all. And it's very frustrating when they don't seem to go our way because there could be feelings of helplessness and powerlessness, uh, feelings of being out of control, but that's simply it's almost like a magical spell where you gave away a dream, forgot that you gave it away, and then now it seems to be happening to you instead of you doing it.
with your own mind. So that's like the spell. It's almost like if, if there was like a, a, a spell cast on all of humanity, that's what the spell is. Is that there are things that are hidden and they're kept secret, and as long as they're hidden and kept secret, then they, they keep getting acted out in the dream that was given away. It's like passing out the parts to all the characters and say, okay, I believe in abandonment. Now you're going to be the one that's going to seem to befriend me and love me and adore me, and then you're going to be the one that will then turn around and leave me. So I can feel all these abandonment feelings, as if the abandonment is occurring in the dream, but actually the abandonment is a belief of what you're dreaming in secret is possible. That it was possible to abandon God or be abandoned by God. That's the dream that's being dreamed in secret. It's really a terrible, dark dream. And then the, the world of form, we seem to get abandoned by, by parents, by children, by lovers, you know, by politicians. You know, it seems to be there's a lot of different abandonment scenes that play out in the dream, but they're just acting out the belief in abandonment that's still held in there. So, everybody knows the story of Jesus, what seemed to happen 2,000 years ago, and, and in The Course in Miracles, he, he says, you know, to the world it seems like I was betrayed and, and abandoned and attacked and so forth. Uh, but he says, but I did not believe in betrayal. In other words, so he was not experiencing any sense of betrayal, no betrayal feelings, even though when you read the story, it looks like there was a character named Judas, uh, who was one of the apostles, who basically uh, turned him in. And from the world's perspective, that, that would clearly be an abandonment or a betrayal, um, Jesus being betrayed. But Jesus says, I, I could not have been betrayed because I didn't believe in betrayal. He had no interpretation of Judas doing anything wrong. In fact, he even would say things in the Bible about, you know, what thou doest do quickly, and, and he forecasts the, the crucifixion and the resurrection. You know, the tearing down of the temple and the rebuilding of the temple. He knew exactly what was going to happen. He wasn't afraid. He was just watching the movie, and uh, letting it all be used for teaching purposes, and he had no sense whatsoever of betrayal, because he didn't believe that betrayal was possible. He had realized that he was one with God, and that betrayal was a crazy concept and belief. However, for centuries after Jesus, I know um, I've been to ch some churches, and around Christmas they they will decide to do the passion play, so they pass out the parts. Somebody's got to play, you know, Peter, and someone plays Jesus, and someone plays Pilate, and someone in the congregation gets stuck with playing uh, Judas, and everybody in the congregation hates that person, <laughs> whoever that person is. <laughs> like, for if they do the play for a week, or and they rehearse it, and then they do it on a Sunday or whatever, this person is hated. They get the looks and glares, like, how could you, you know, like they're the worst of the worst. Because they're, all the beliefs in betrayal is being projected onto the character that's playing Judas, you know. Or even in the story of Adam and Eve, you know, it's like, uh, for, for many, many centuries, snakes have had a bad rap. Because the devil was the snake. <laughs> and now they... They're trying to figure out if the fear of snakes is coded somehow into human beings' <laughs> DNA or whatever, but it could go all the way back to the, the original story of Genesis. You know, the snake is a bad rap. The snake is like the tempter that comes in and, and says to Adam, come over here and listen to me. You know, I've got, a, I've got something for you. So, so the most important thing that we do when we look into all of this is we, we have to get in touch with what is it that we've been dreaming in secret? What is it that we've been lying to ourselves about, that we feel so bad about that we're hiding? Uh, why is it that when we sink down into deeper meditations, we get frightened of what's happening? Um, why is it when we have some very profound loving experience in our life, where we feel so loved and adored, and we feel so much love, 
that there's usually a backlash of fear that comes right after that love. Almost like we don't even deserve it. Like we shudder uh, that we could be so loved. You know, it's such a, a, a jolting experience from our daily experience. Those are all the questions that we're, we're looking at to explore and to actually go deeper into the mind so that we can uncover what it is that we actually believe in. And like um, we were talking this morning at the breakfast table and the idea came up, uh, Sarah was saying, well, it is a, it's all an illusion. And Jackie was saying, well, that's not where my mind's at. I, you know, I, it's, it's where I'd like to go, but, but actually I must believe something else if I'm still having frustrations or irritations and annoyances come up. Or like in religion, um, you may go from, people have gone from no religions, I mean, I know Christian considered she really was raised a non-religious life, even though Jesus appeared at a, in a vision and said, I will be your guide. But what was the story when you were 15 and you, your mother showed you a picture? picture. Picture and a wardrobe. Sorry, I'm speaking this man. <laughs> 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 Jamesy, don't you know who that is? <laughs> oh, who? <yeah. laughs> <laughs> what, what have I done? You're <laughs> <laughs> very familiar, though. Beautiful. Oh, I can't wear this man. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, we've told that story over in the United States down in the Bible Belt, and people just react like, you've got to be kidding. You can't seriously believe, ask me to believe that. But whether you come from a, a, like a non-religious background, or if you're very religious, yeah. extremely religious, um, it, it all comes down to, uh, you have to come to a sense of honesty with where your state of mind is. Like, um, I know when I've gone to like, what are called more new thought churches, uh, believing that God is love and God is pure love, and so on and so forth. Um, that is a beautiful teaching, and yet you have to take a look at your experience. If you have struggles, and doubts, and fears, and pain, and suffering, and sickness, disease, all of those kind of things really don't go with the teaching that God is love, because if God is love, then where did all that come from? You know? and so what we're looking at is coming to a practical experience of consistent peace of mind. And uh, even when we talk about healing, you know, usually when we talk about healing, we're talking about removal of symptoms, you know, from the body, or we're talking about psychological healing, of coming, letting go of a, of a certain pain or hurt or something. And and in the Course in Miracles, Jesus says to heal is to make happy. So that's like lifting our definition of healing up to a state of mind instead of uh, something like symptom removal. And generally when I talk about sickness, we get into these deep talks about what is, what is even the meaning of sickness? What does it even mean to be sick? Because uh, you, you realize that you have to go through such a, a clearing of your mind, such a washing away of your old definitions, that before you can even come to an understanding of what sickness is or what healing is, there's a lot of washing away, a lot of clearing that has to occur. Or as the Buddhists say, you really have to empty your mind of a lot of things before you can start to get to the core experience of, of what is actually healing. Because healing really isn't a process, it's actually a state of mind. And you might say that anything that obscures that state of mind is, is part of the error of sickness. Not something so simple as a cold or the flu, or something that's defined in very uh, medical terms. So, that's kind of our basis here. We've got a lot of things that we can kind of go into so deeply that it's kind of like it unravels. Some of the questions start to unravel a bit the deeper you go. You start to say, hmm, you know, that's... Is uh, sickness a uh, separation? A sense of separation? Yeah, yeah. It's, it's always a sense of separation. Yes, it's a well, sickness is a defense against the truth. Yeah. It's like a way of trying to be little, or small, or insignificant. It's a way of being, trying to be irrelevant, or unimportant, when you were created by God to be magnificent, 
know, as a magnificent being, it's like a trick to try to bring forth a witness to say, see, I'm right about myself, and you're wrong about me. Which is really quite an arrogant, that's why sickness is quite <laughs> arrogant. Uh, most of the time we think of sickness as something to be pitied. You know, some of us are sick, oh, poor baby, oh, you know, but it's not something at all to be pitied. It's, it's more of um, uh, starting to take a look at how arrogant the thought is, because it claims that you're something else than the, what God created you to be. And there could be, that's like arrogance on a, on a scale of, of great magnitude, you know, in terms of identity. But we start with where you perceive. In other words, we don't start from the top of, okay, you were created to be the Christ, and then we work down from there to the human being. We start from the human experience of, well, here's what I feel, here's what I perceive, here's what I seem to believe in, and so on and so forth. And then we come together and call on the Holy Spirit to show us another way, to show us that that what we are believing, and what we're clinging to and holding on to, you know, is, is not really worth clinging to. We can relax a bit, trust a bit, and uh, start to let go, take our fingers off of the, of the ego. Something's pushing my buttons. Because of everything that we've seen. I've got about private thoughts um, of our in the past. So, and, and what really brought it up was the, what we were talking about at breakfast. And I, I seem to be sick because I'm developing a headache and a backache. Um, <laughs> so all these things are coming together. Um, and it's, and I can't contact it. I don't know what it is, and I, I want to be able to trace that back to what the belief is. But the catalyst this morning was the, 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 the high beliefs, for instance, that, you know, the, the world is an illusion and all I have to do is believe that and it'll all, come, it'll all be okay, irritated me. It, it really, um, and I could feel that, and it's like, well, that's not my experience. Why isn't it my experience? Why can't I get there? What, what do I have to do? And it, it's, it's like I'm trying to drive it, and I can't get me out of there. So how do I go about that? Because it's, it's, it's just stifling. I can feel, and I've been having fainting type episodes where I do go quite lightheaded because it feels as if it's stifling me. Yeah. And I want to get me out of there. Where do I start with that? How do I trace that back to, to what I'm really believing? Yeah, it does fit exactly with what I was saying about the fear to look within. In other words, there's such a, a terror of, of going inside the mind. That's why this whole world was made to get distracted, to get, so to speak, out on the screen, get so caught up into the form and the outcomes and the images and the appearances that you would forget about content or essence of what's actually happening in the mind. And so you could say, first of all, that to put things into context, that to try to be a human being is to try to be mindless. Uh, you know, that's, that's the whole purpose of of the human race, is to try to be mindless. In other words, you know, to get so out of your mind, we could say out of your divine mind for sure, but, but even out of the split mind, because, ah, yipes, that's schizophrenic, uh, to have a split mind that believes in two things, you know, one that believes in forgiveness and, and healing, and one part that believes in death, uh, and those two don't even ever meet and touch. It's, it's like an intolerable feeling. Of, of having a split mind, and then that feeling is so intolerable that a, a world is projected that seems to be external, and then in that external world, the mind identifies with the body, and with family, and country, and all these things that seem to be its identity, and rips onto that, like a like one of these little pit bulls that you know comes over and grabs your trousers. And, 
no matter what you do, you know, the, the teeth are clenched, you know, it's like really firmly wanting to hold on to that. And then, as you begin to start to awaken and to question these things, you know, the resistance to letting go of that grip is really what you're experiencing. It can seem to play out in symptoms like a headache, a backache, or something like this. It can be more subtle emotional symptoms like frustration. Or if you bring it, start very specifically, like being at the breakfast table this morning and, and hearing the phrase, well, yes, but that's an illusion too, we need to remember that, and then having a reaction to that. Um, when, uh, let's say, high metaphysics are used as kind of like a cover-over of what's underneath, that would be a defense mechanism. You could say it's, it's, it's another form of, of denial or the ego quoting scripture, or in any way you want. But, but, you reacting to it is simply, Jesus says, whenever you react to uh, a defense mechanism that you perceive in a brother or a sister, you're failing to forgive yourself for the very same attempt. So that's a great insight. Like, oh, so, so it's as if there's a brother or a sister, and they're acting in their ego, or they're they're in a state of denial or whatever, and then, but the frustration is not coming from that, it's coming from the fail to forgive yourself for the very same attempt. So the mind is in a state of denial, it projects out a world, and then it assigns a character to play out uh, a defense mechanism. And then it seems as if it's frustrating to, to have to deal with this brother or sister, but they're just a trigger or a reminder of something that's that's within one's own mind that has to be dealt with and addressed. So that's why Jesus says you should always have great appreciation for all your brothers and sisters because they're simply pointing out or reflecting back to you something that you need to look at yourself but that you're you have decided not to look at and they're showing you ah oh, this is something you need to take another look at. And that's the only way that you wake up. That's why we should have such gratitude for everyone in our life, no matter what role they seem to be playing. They're more like mirrors. They're mirroring and showing us what we're holding on to. So, so in that sense, it's like if you're failing to forgive yourself for the same attempt, then you can bring it back to, okay, I've, I've done this before. Why would I get upset at a brother or sister for something that, that I've done? myself. If I'm, if I'm going to be beneficent and kind and forgiving and loving of myself, then I have to extend that same grace to everyone. So that's like the very beginning of the inroads to it. So if it starts there with forgiving the brother, you're actually really forgiving that same thing in the same. Yes. Yeah. yeah. You're, you're releasing, you're, you're okay. saying, uh, I give this defense mechanism to you, Holy Spirit, um, knowing that if I give it to you, it, it, it has no harm. It can do no harm at all. Um, any any time I've, I've seen to use it in the past, that's all covered. It's like a blanket insurance policy that it covers all occurrences of the defense. Uh, and by giving it over, uh, you feel a peace come back into your heart. So also the guilt that I felt when I was sitting here, I must have done something wrong, or I shouldn't have said that, or I shouldn't have expressed what I expressed in, the, in that way, that's the, my own guilt that I've made the same mistake in the past. Yeah. I'm yeah. not forgiven. Yeah. Is that right? It's just coming up again. Right. And coming up again for healing. I think a lot of times when, when things start to come up, you know, the, the ego will say, aha, look, you aren't so spiritual, or look, you're not living this, uh, you're not a good example of this, and it's, it just concludes, see, that you're guilty because of this, instead of seeing it from the Holy Spirit's perspective of, oh, it's good that it's coming up. It needs to come up. It actually needs to come up for healing. Because you can't release something that you're keeping hidden. You can't release something from awareness that you're not even allowing into awareness. You're certainly not going to release it. Or it's like the story of, you know, how when in the ocean, the deeper you go down into the ocean, the more there's, this, there's a compressed compression. There's, there's more pressure as you go down deeper because of the weight of the ocean. 
So like if you had a bubble that started off at the bottom of the ocean, it was a tiny compressed bubble, and it just started to expand and expand as it got higher towards the surface of the ocean because the pressure, the water pressure, uh, wasn't so great. And it finally gets to the top and then it just pops because it, it's like there's no pressure. It just pops and it's open into the air. And that's very much a good metaphor for how things are in the mind. That, that when the ego is way deep down in your mind and there's all this weight, it's been so buried and pushed out of awareness, it's, it's like this tiny thing but it's highly pressurized. And the more that you allow those, that bubble to come up closer to the surface, the more that you're closer to true healing. You can actually, in the end, it makes it all the way to the surface and just joins the air. And the bubble is gone. There's, it just reunites with all the other uh, gases. So, so that's why it's so important in the healing to let those emotions come up. And in one sense, you do have to be discerning. We were talking last night that if you just let yourself free associate and say everything that you were feeling in your family system or your, with your friends or whatever, that's when you, they may just want to discommit you and lock you up. <laughs> like, you know, you shouldn't be walking around <laughs> on the planet. You're disturbing, <laughs> you're disturbing the planet with all that. But that's why people, you know, go to see a therapist. That's why people, even in course groups, you have to have a, a certain amount of trust, a certain amount of uh, feeling that you won't be judged before you're going to start to let some of those bubbles up, some of those private thoughts up. Because if you have if too much fear of being judged, why risk it, you know? Why risk it is the way the ego says. Who is judging? It's just judging in the mind. It's that the ego is the one that's always judging. But again, remember, if the ego is the judgmental thought, and the ego made up this world, then the, the mind, the person fears being judged by others. Often, because but it's in your own because mind. it's in one's because own mind. Because you've made that world yeah. up. Yeah. So every thought that you have is only ever in, in yes. your own mind. It's only in your own mind. It's only in the mind. The mind. It's yeah. better to even talk about the mind instead of your mind and my mind because then it starts to get complex. Oh, I've done my forgiveness lessons, but you're still angry. Oh, how tricky. You see how it's then my mind and your mind. Well, my mind's healed, but your mind's not. Gosh. And we're back to that same split, you know. Whereas, when I am healed, I am not healed alone. You know, healing has to be for everyone. So everyone must benefit from your healing experience. And it can't be that you're healed and they're not, or that they're healed and you're not. That's another tricky one. Oh, they've all got it. They look so happy, so joyful, so loving. They're laughing all the time. Yeah. They've got it and I don't. That's just another comparison trick. It's still, you know, a way of beating yourself up and saying, you know, I'm not there. I'm not there yet. And woe to me. Woe is me because I'm not there. So it's, these are all the tricks of the ego of trying to splinter it out and make it seem, you know, like a complicated thing. But it's, it's all about really opening up and seeing that everything is connected and that it's all one mind. That's where the peace comes. Can I have a question then? Because I felt when, when we were at the table, and this is what I talked about yesterday, so it's interesting, you know, because we are projecting everything we believe in ourselves. And, you know, what I asked of yesterday and what happened this morning is like, the things I feel, I feel, and um, sometimes I say things because that's just how I I, know, I see them to be. Mm -hmm. And I, but I it's still like I want it to come from the heart. Um, then I felt you, and then I got like, gosh, should I have said that, or you know, does this mean that, or does that mean this? And you know, it got so complicated again, and it was just like, no, I just want to be able to. You know, like you can sit there and just say things that seems to be accepted, and um, I don't know what I'm missing to be able to speak. Um. Yeah, that's, I think we'll just use the example of what happened uh, this morning at the, at the breakfast table, because it's a great example. It's a practical, that's what we're always saying. 
bring up a practical example and let's use it. So that's exactly what we're doing. You know, with, when the discussion got into A Course in Miracles, then the discussion got into A Course in Miracles teachers, and you were, you were saying even in a broader context, there are many teachers. Of course, everything and everyone is teaching us, but there are many teachers, and then, then Jackie, you were bringing up and saying, uh, that Marianne Williamson was, was one of these teachers, and she seemed to start off, you know, very much on track, you know, I guess referring to her book, you know, uh, Return to Love, and which is, of course, the miracles, for many people, a huge introduction into it. And then, subsequently, in, in later years, has written other books, The Healing of America, and A Woman's Worth, and da 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 da, da. so kind of referring to, well, you know, I... I I'm perceiving some differences, or you might say some going away from, from core fundamental course teachings, mm -hmm. and that you were saying that's important for me. I have, I'm using it for my own discernment, but I'm not going to just gloss over and say, well, they're all the same. Uh, mm -hmm. I'm perceiving some distinctions, and I think that there's something meaningful for my own discernment. That's what I heard you say. Yeah. And, and you were saying, well, we're, we're kind of learning from everyone, and she's where she seems to be at, and she's providing her blessing where she's at. And, and so, what is underneath uh, all of that in terms of what's helpful and what's constructive? And I'm reminded of, of a teacher that uh, I was just adored as I was growing up. Um, there was a, a teacher named Krishnamurti, and uh, Krishnamurti would go travel these continents always going, staying in warm weather and doing these continents, and, and people would raise all kinds of topics. They would say, well, Buddha says this, but Jesus says this, and Krishna, Lord Krishna says this. I mean, imagine going around the world to all these continents. you got all these different religions, you got all these different teachers, tens of thousands of different teachers, famous teachers throughout history, and he's simply there to have an open discussion, and some will come forth as well. But Buddha says, aha, aha, mm -hmm. but Jesus says, and he basically would say, very politely, sirs, madams, uh, can we come to the point? In other words, if you have a question to raise, let's just look at the ideas, not who said what, uh, who wrote what. He was unconcerned if it came from Jesus, Buddha, Krishna, Joe, Joe down the road, Fred, Margaret, it didn't matter. It's like, it's like let's look at the ideas here. We should be able to come together and join and just say, what resonates for all of us? There's certain ideas that must really resonate in, our, in the core of our being. Can we come together and explore those without getting into personalities? <laughs> so, that's why where the discernment comes in is, is if you take one example and say, a teacher seems to be talking about politics, that we need to... Uh, have a political solution, you know, we need to have a peace department, or we need to have this, or this, or this, or that. And, and for your own discernment, it would be raising up the question in your mind, like, is there a political solution to the human condition? Uh, will politics solve uh, the human condition? And if you explore that, I think, and we all would go deeper and deeper into that, we would say from experience, that there's been many political attempts, many treaties signed, <laughs> uh, many governments formed, many governments uh, disbanded. Uh, throughout human history, there have been many attempts at having some kind of a political solution that would bring about peace and harmony and happiness. And if you just watch how history has unfolded, you could probably conclude <laughs> that none of them have worked. And, in fact, in A Course in Miracles, Jesus actually says, seek not to change the world, seek rather to change your mind about the world. Something that resonates when we read that. It's like, hmm, uh -huh. I've been going about this the wrong way. I thought the politicians were to blame. They weren't doing enough to save the ecosystem, or uh, they weren't disarming the world. They were arming the world instead of disarming the world, or, you know, it's easy to point to politicians, it's easy to point to governments, it's easy to blame a few people that were either appointed as a king or a queen or elected or 
uh, somehow made it into political office and say, they're the problem. Um, if, if they weren't doing what they're doing, I would be happy. That's just another version of the blame game. So, when we come together with these things, in, in one sense we can leave the, the specifics out. Who said what, um, you know, it doesn't give it any more weight. In fact, uh, at the beginning when I was, I read the course for like two and a half, for, for eight hours a day, for two and a half years or whatever, I would go around and I was just so excited like a little <laughs> boy. And I would be talking and say, well, Jesus says that, 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 Jesus says that, that, Jesus says, until finally somebody stopped me and said, okay, okay, we get it, Jesus says that, 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 what do you say? And I was just, well, of course I say what Jesus says. I was almost like, I was like, that's assumed. But they were like, no, what do you feel? What do you have to say here? What, what is your experience was really what they were asking. Don't, why do you have to preface everything that comes out of your mouth? with Jesus says. And of course, there are no universal symbols. I mean, you go, you could go over to uh, Indonesia and Saudi Arabia and the Middle East and many places and if you started to say, Jesus says, Jesus says, people would be, so what? Muhammad says, <laughs> or, you know, Lao Tzu says, or whatever, you know, there's nothing special about a person, uh, be they male, female, young or old. So this is where you start to have it not be personal, because whenever it's personal, whenever it even seems like there's a character out there named Mary Williamson, and Mary Williamson seems to have said and done some things, and seems to be a certain way, as soon as we pull out of the entire cosmos of images, the zillions and zillions and zillions of images, we pull one out, of the whole tapestry of the cosmos, one little strand, we call it Mary and Williamson, the judgment's already been made. It doesn't matter whether she's the most glowing, perfect example of, of light and love and being, or if she's the worst example, you know, a hypocrite and a fake and a phony, it wouldn't really matter. As soon as we've made the first label, we've pulled out of the tapestry that is the one, the forgiven world, which is all the images are equally the same, equally... It's exactly what happened when we walked in here. Peter said, I turned everything into a question. So, that was the cue, wasn't it? Yeah. That was yeah. it. He said, question. So, what did that mean? It meant, is there a, is there a solution in politics for this world? Is there a solution in... What it, in women's issues for this for this mind? No, it, it, it's the question to be asked, not who posed it or who wrote it. Or yes. Ding ding. Ding ding. And it's so freeing. <laughs> so then you say, it's like, oh, I, it doesn't even matter what they said or what they seem to do or whatever. But because as soon as as I pull them out of the whole tapestry and I give them a name. Whether it's pencil, or whether it's pen, or whether it's Marion Williamson, it doesn't really matter. As soon as I make a label for something that's just a tiny part, I've lost the whole. Yeah. Because the whole is the whole. And even we grew up with sayings like, the whole transcends the sum of the parts. That's a beautiful saying. You know, eventually Jesus retranslated that for me. He said, well, the reason that's real, and that's so, that the whole transcends the sum of the parts, is because the whole is real, and there are no parts. Mm. Oh, well, that explains it. No wonder the whole transcends the sum of the parts. Wholeness is what God created. Uh, God didn't fragment, you know, <coughs> billions and billions and zillions of images, and then say, oh, now that I've done it, maybe I should start giving them names. <laughs> you know, and people even interpret things from the Bible where they'll say, there's not a hair on your head that's not known by God. Actually, God doesn't know the hair on your head. And God doesn't know your head. <laughs> and God doesn't know your body. And God doesn't know your specific name. And we have workbook lessons in the Course in Miracles that say things like, let all things be echoes of the voice for God, which say, Instead of using all these trivial little names that you made up, or that the ego made up, why not let the name of God be the safe replacement for all the little names that you made, meaning the ego? Oh, 
that's starting to get pretty humbling. Instead of thinking all these parts are so important, and all these names are important, and who said what, and who's on track, and who's off track, and you know, all this huge distraction going on, we can simply go, maybe I was mistaken about all of this naming business. Maybe God is not in the, in the duplicity and in the multiplicity. Maybe God actually is oneness and pure love and union. And maybe the religions have just been naming, giving God different names, Jehovah, Jehovah Yahweh, you know, Atman, all these different names, when God is nameless and, and just a, a beautiful, loving being and experience that literally is beyond naming. It's the ego that then names everything. So it, it makes it very simple. You start to see, oh, I'm off the hook. It's not like I really have to figure out who's on track and who's off track. It's just that I need to free my mind from this mechanism that's, that's trying to do that. And that's where the freedom comes. You see how simple it is, too. Once you kind of are popped back into that perspective, then it's like, ah, okay. <laughs> And then it should be easy to go into the specifics to, to work with forgiveness. Yeah, it should get lighter and lighter. Yeah. And then it's sort of, just this morning I looked at something in Chester. And we had a, a session. And, and it was something in her mind, too, in her mind. And I just thought about this with private thoughts. And it's not really that because if I have a, have a problem, it is really reflected in what I see and what I experience. Yeah. And, and then we can solve it together because we just think it's a good one. I'm seeing that the ego thoughts. They're just ego thoughts. So I believe in them or I don't. And we may both seem to believe in them. Yeah, because <laughs> we just need to both believe in the ego thoughts are real. Yeah. yeah. That's it. It doesn't change the opportunity to work mm -hmm. with it together. Yeah. 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 It doesn't change ego thoughts or private thoughts don't change reality. You know. It's like again, like to use a metaphor from the course, it's like uh, it's like the sunbeam telling the sun what to do, or like the the ripple, you know. That's the fear that it could change reality. Yeah. Having this dark, terrible thought of everything will, I will die, or something yeah. terrible will happen. Yeah, that's the fear. And that's, of course, why the, the private thoughts are pushed, pushed out of awareness. Because it's like it's danger, you know, the idea that oh my gosh, it would be dangerous to to contemplate or to think think those thoughts. They seem to make the world. In other words, it's, we're not trying to dismiss the power of the mind or the power of thoughts, because as Jesus is saying, everything that you perceive in the entire cosmos is is a result of of thinking. It's just that we need to to go much deeper than that and say, okay. Uh, then maybe there's a distinction between what he calls real thoughts and unreal thoughts. So he would call the thoughts of time and space, form, images, projection, and so on and so forth, those are the unreal thoughts. And, uh, yeah, you can see, there can seem to be hurricanes and tsunamis, there can seem to be wars, uh, there can seem to be interpersonal conflicts, there can seem to be lots of things that arise uh, from those ego thoughts, and the message is, is okay, and just remember, the ego is not real. <laughs> those are not your real thoughts. Those are not the thoughts that you think with God. Those are thoughts that you're trying to think apart from God. Like making up your own nightmare, and, you know, making up, you know, who's afraid of the big bad wolf? Well, if you make up a nightmare, and you frighten yourself, then it's like, you might say that Jesus, God, and the Spirit are like this waiting thing. There's another way. Uh, you don't have to uh, stay in that nightmare. You know, we're not. 
There's no attempt to interrupt the nightmare. There's no attempt to steal the nightmare away. You know, like a little child, a, a baby, if a baby's playing and then suddenly a baby grabs a fork or a knife and it's very sharp, a uh, baby could hard, hurt itself with that sharp knife. But of course, if you go as a parent and you try to take the knife away from the baby, the baby's, no, my knife! <laughs> And the parents are like, no, 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 I'm not going to let you play with that knife. But the baby doesn't know that it's dangerous. You know, the baby just, mine, <laughs> my toy. Don't take my toy away from me. Well, it's kind of like the mind that fell asleep you now has made up this ego. And it's saying, my toy, my toy. God's saying, come on, give it back. You shouldn't be playing with that. <laughs> <laughs> That's not a good thing to play with. Here you go. Mine. Mine. You know, so this is why we're, we're talking about you can't hold on and protect those ego thoughts because God is not going to come in and rip the ego away. God is not, does not rip. <laughs> There's no ripping with God. It has to be voluntarily handed over. You know, we have to voluntarily say, okay, playing with this ego has not brought me happiness constant happiness. It may seem to bring some pleasures and some pains and some good times and bad times, but it definitely hasn't brought me constant peace and happiness. And so when I start to gauge it from that perspective, then I have to become more willing to, to hand it over. And what we're talking about here is those private thoughts, like Jenny was saying, when you're, you're having those thoughts and they don't feel good, the tendency has always been to push them down. You know, I can't say this. What will people think of me? This will ruin my reputation. <laughs> you know, they won't love me. They won't invite me to things anymore. I'll be lonely. I'll you know, on and on and on. And, and this is saying, okay, now what about going the other direction and coming together, we could say symbolically, with people who are all wanting to be healed of this thought system. And as soon as things are talked about, they're just put out there, like put on the table, like, oh, here's the thought I'm having, Plop, plopped on the table. Not, the ego will always want to take those thoughts personal, it's like a personal insult or a personal assault, but they really aren't. They're just, the Holy Spirit doesn't see anything personal or insulting about them. They're almost like gifts to the Holy Spirit. Oh, thank you for not clutching onto that thing and hiding it anymore. Thank you for bringing it out into the open. And, and then when you all laugh together at the thoughts, you know, like last night I was talking about this comedian Don Rickles, who was like always spewing out <laughs> all these private thoughts about everybody, and everybody was laughing. Well, there's, it's much healing when people start to laugh at their differences. You know, he, he would call, he would use stereotypical images about Black people, white people, ethnic groups, uh, racial sorts of He would use all the things that people say you better never say in public. And he would say it about everyone. He just didn't do it about one or two, he did it about everyone. He was completely all-inclusive in his uh, spewing out of all these private thoughts. And then people, people laughed. Uh, because it was almost like laughing at the differences. Like, these are real differences. These concepts don't really separate us. You know, they really are just laughable. And as soon as you get to the point of laughter, then you know that the healing is, is genuine, because you're not taking it serious at all. That's what happens in sessions. You're at sessions every morning at the Peace House at 9, for like two hours. Sure, you've got the book to start out with, but it turns into, okay, Everybody just has got to share and expose all the thoughts and the things that needed healing throughout the day or the day before. Just to expose it and make it lighter. And most of the time, we're all ready to laugh at them, but if they really believe it's serious, sometimes, like, hold the face and, and keep kind of like, okay, this is really important to them. But as soon as they're ready to pop, then everybody can join in the laugh. Yeah. It's like Jenny said, it's so not personal. It's really not like one person's thought or another. So it's such a waste of energy to determine if it's yours or mine, or if it's true. Were you really thinking that? Mm -hmm. uh -uh. That's like a misuse of intuitive skill.
can, it can seem like at one stage, oh, I'm really intuitive because I can pick up what you're thinking. But you got to take it back and see that if you still see error out there, it's a misperception. Beyond. That's an interesting <laughs> one. That's very good. Yeah, that's an interesting one. Like, so psychics and people who can apparently read your mind or read some past relative's mind or what they wish for you, it's still a projection out there in the world. So it's still the ego. It's just, as you say, a misuse of intuition, of the intuitive. Is that what you're saying? Is that what yeah, it's like a, a stepping stone along the way. It seems like all of a sudden you pick up all of these thoughts, mm -hmm. but the ego will take that and say, it's there or it's there or it's, it's attributed to a specific person. Yeah. To take the next step towards healing mm -hmm. is to see it's not personal and they're just completely unreal thoughts, but mm -hmm. they seem to be in mind. It's a joint effort to heal the mind. Yeah. So you bring it back to your own mind, always, always, always. However, however intuitive or spiritual it seems to be, yeah. it always is only in in your mind. Is that what I'm, is that yeah. what I'm hearing? You just identify it as literally unreal, like oh, yeah. it's just a movement of thought. That's not mm -hmm. me. There's and no it's color. Me. It's not them. Right. Yeah. Yeah. And otherwise, it turns to judgment. Yeah. Because, sure, you can see a block, whether it's in your mind or you can start to see someone else as having a difficulty or a block. But that's, that's not really helpful. It's only when you bring it back and you see I still believe in it. Mm -hmm. But if you say, oh, that's a block, we're stuck with that, that's how they are, then it's seeing the error as being real. Right. So it always has to be to bring it back to mm -hmm. facing yeah. it. Yeah, this world is like... You know, you've heard about like going to the circus and like a hall of mirrors or you know, some kind of a sophisticated uh, apparatus for, for fooling the mind. For like magicians use all kinds of different things, you know, to trick the mind and fool the mind into believing things. This whole world is a big trick. As if ideas can leave their source and thoughts can leave the thinker and, and go out there and that, oh, there's, now there's one. One thinker? No, there's six billion thinkers out there. Ooh, a trick. It's, it's this false thinker, which is the ego, is just thinking a bunch of unreal thoughts, has disguised itself and blasted out a world with six billion seemingly separate independent thinkers. Oh, that's a pretty good trick. And now these six billion are always conflicting. They never are thinking the same things. And it's never harmonious. <laughs> they're they're insecure. They see all these thoughts. Now there's six billion. I sometimes trying to kill each other, plotting, suspicious. What's that song from Elvis? We're caught in the trap. We can't walk out. You know, we can't go on together with suspicious mind. You know, it's like this suspicions out there. So now you're starting to begin to understand. Wait a minute. This is all a big trick. As if those separate thoughts are out there being acted out in all these people, when it's actually, there are no secrets. And we have brought some great movies, I think we brought along like Ed TV. Yeah. And I'll, I'll tell you a little bit about this movie Ed TV, because this is kind of a way of popping the whole trick. These are amazing movies now that are coming out that are showing, oh, it's, it's like that Bee Gees song, I started the joke, it started the whole world crying. But I couldn't see that the joke was on me, you know. It's been in the music and the movies for years. In Ed TV, you've heard of these reality TV shows, you know, where they have a camera, they follow someone around. Well, they decide that they're going to make a TV show called Reality TV, but it's really far from reality, but it's going to expose <laughs> the, the trick of the world. And basically they follow Ed around and and Ed, and you get to meet Ed, and then you get to meet Ed's brother, and Ed's brother's girlfriend, and the camera's are always on, you know, they got the, all these cameras running, a camera following Ed around, and the cameraman's always catching all these things. So you've got Ed talking there, and then you've got Ed's brother talking, and then Ed's brother's girlfriend's kind of shy on the camera and everything. 
And then the camera catches Ed's brother's girlfriend looking at Ed, kind of admiring, attracted, looking. You know, it's like all the things, the nuances, <laughs> broadcast, you know, to everybody, to all these different viewers, is catching all the nuances. And so, basically, Ed goes, at some point later on, goes over to visit his brother, and he's got a woman in his apartment. Uh, Ed's brother does, not his girlfriend, his brother's girlfriend. So he catches this affair on there, and then Ed has to go over and talk to the girlfriend, and she's seen it all. It's all public knowledge. It's not like there's any private thoughts. She's seen it all on television. That's the whole mechanism is showing that what if there were no secrets? What if actually everything that you thought was broadcast as common knowledge to everyone? Well, wouldn't that accelerate the healing? <laughs> you know, wouldn't that accelerate it in, a, in, a, in an enormous way? Because you would start to see there's no differences. You know, that these are just a bunch of dramas and everything that are coming from these private thoughts. And then you'd be more likely to give them all up. But through the, the disguise of this world, it's like it seems as if things seem to take time, secrets take time to be uncovered. You know, you see that in the paper, or, you know, uh, Jimmy Hoffa's bones discovered, or, you know, sometimes it seems to take, you know, years or decades before ancient buried secrets are revealed. But imagine if there was a way of speeding it all up, so you could see that, that all of it is part of the same trick. Imagine how guilt-free you would be, too, if you realized that you didn't really have any real dark secrets. That you really hadn't harmed God, that you hadn't changed reality one bit, and that you were still perfectly innocent. And this whole thing called the human experience was just a trick to make you feel guilty. And that's, that's worth going for. Could you speak up a bit, please? <clears throat> forgiveness um, is a very powerful liberator. Mm. Um, you know, we we um, we can forgive our families. We find it difficult to forgive our families. So how, how can we forgive politicians? And I think releasing all these people that we hold. Uh, grudges against or bitterness against is very liberating though it's done wonders for me. Mm -hmm. yeah. mm -hmm. I, I, you know, you find that um, going through life you come across people you either love at first sight or you don't like at first sight, you know. And I work with in a in a committee I work with a lady who is very difficult to get on with because she was in every committee that ever was and in every committee she was in she she dismantled it because it had to be her way and of course I had heard this from other people so that made me more determined to work with her and see if I could, could win but I just didn't in the end but then I came across the Course in Miracles and other publications and one of the practices I had to do was to um, go through and think out everybody that I had any, that I held in, in any sort of judgment. And um, one day in my, I was inspired to pick up the phone, even though years after, probably 20 years later. <laughs> Uh, and I rang up and I said to Pauline, I said, it's Tom McNair here. 
Um, I'm just ringing up to say um, I'm sorry if I ever offended you or hurt you in any way. And the same for Lynn, her husband, you know. She, she, was, always, she was obviously really taken back at the point because there was a, a big silence. <laughs> and I just wonder what happened afterwards. But I just, uh, I said, and I wish you the best in luck or something like that, you know. But I felt so relieved from this because this was the, after going through all my list that I could ever reach as far back as I could remember. This was the one that was the most difficult to forgive. And yet, there was no reason in the world why I should hold on to that burden. But I felt so relieved. And so in the spur of the moment, I just picked up the phone. It's gone. Silence. That's great. So, if, if that's taken back, that experiential thing of I created the world I, know, I see, I made the world I see. It's all about me doing, isn't it? Maybe I'll win. May, this, this person is difficult to work with because she wanted it her way. That's just the ego, isn't it? Yeah. In yourself. Is that right? So, so everything is just the ego projected out there for you to be able to look at it and forgive it. And forgive it? Yeah, I think the, the core issue is what is called an authority issue. In other words, the question is really, am I the author of myself or is God my author? I mean, if, if you really had to boil it down to one question, and it's, it's being asked at a very deep level, uh, am I the author of myself, or is, is God my author? And what does that mean? If, if God authored me in spirit, then I must be as still as God created me. It must, you know, it's in the Bible it said God created man in his likeness and image. But uh, that just must mean, properly interpreted, that, that man is spirit, and not flesh at all. <laughs> it must be that mankind is really spirit. This is like a big mask that's been drawn over the spirit. And if that's the case, I must be as God created me. I must still be spirit. But the alternative is the belief that I can make myself, which is the belief that I can make myself any way I want to be. I can make myself material. I can make myself young, old, male, female, fat, skinny. I can dress myself up or be naked, I can make myself a product of this country, that country, product of these parents, those parents, what they call reincarnation, and it's almost just like shifting the images around and around. In an adamant stance, no, I can make myself the way I want to be, and I'm going to keep playing with these images until I find one that I like. I don't like that one, no, try this, try this. That's what millenniums have been about. It's like this ego mind trying to make up an image, make up a concept, make up an identity that God didn't create. And then seeing it as if you can hold on to one mask and see different masks. And say, I don't like those masks over there, but I like this mask. And, you know, the Holy Spirit is gently saying, you'll never be content with the masks. And whatever you're seeing, like that, that woman on the commissions, or that person that you see here or there, and this and that, if you find something you dislike about them, that's just <laughs> reflecting your own dislike about yourself, the way that the ego has made you. Because human beings don't feel whole and complete. They always are seemingly in process, trying to become better, you know, more whatever, more happy, more healthy, more famous, more rich, more more of something. It's like this, their whole life is more, 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 you know, always trying to become something different than they already are. And that's because the very mechanism underneath is is like an idol. It, it's, it's not a true identity. So the only way out of this perplexing seeming problem is to let go of the ego, you know, to, to release the, the belief in the ego and accept yourself as God created you instead of trying to make, to do God one better, like, okay, right, you created me perfect, but just give me a chance 
to see see what I can do. <laughs> and it's like the sunbeam telling the sun, I'm over here, you're over there. I'm a sunbeam and I'm proud of it and I'm apart from you. When in fact the sunbeam is not <laughs> really apart from the sun. And the ripple is not apart, you know, from the ocean. The ripple can think it's independent, has its own autonomous existence, but but a ripple is just part of the ocean. And that's we're all still part of the ocean of of love. So so every time we feel you feel any kind of frustration, if you traced it down deep enough, that would be what you could always trace it down to that one question. Am I as God created me? Or can I make myself just the way that I want to be? You see the rebelliousness in in the second part. <laughs> No, and you're all saying letting go of the ego. You can't completely let go of the ego. Well, is that possible? It is. In fact, that's the whole point of A Course in Miracles. Is you might say that atonement, or complete forgiveness, mm -hmm. is letting go of the ego completely. So that's the goal. That's and the goal, that's yeah. The goal. Yeah, but I don't think you can completely... Let go of the ego. It's just a belief. In other words, if that's the goal, and and if we said the goal is God's plan for salvation, then God's plan for salvation must be possible. In other words, if we say that's the goal, but it's not possible, then that would be like saying that God's God's plan is a nice idea, but it's just not possible. But no, the course is saying, oh no, it's it's actually more than possible. It's inevitable. <laughs> That the more that you fight against forgiveness and against the plan, you're just get, making, giving yourself an illusion of struggle for as, for as long as you want to do it. You're just you're fighting against the inevitable. Ego doesn't like that word inevitable. It would much mm. <laughs> rather believe that salvation is impossible. <laughs> but if you're on about private thoughts, that's the ego again. Yeah. Like with the past. Yes. So if you completely let go of the ego, are you saying that you don't have any private thoughts? Yeah, then then all the thoughts... I don't think that's possible. Yeah, but what it is, is, is saying that from that state of mind, all that you think, you think with God. What does that mean? Let's talk about it in a practical sense. Imagine that... You have two voices in your mind. One is ego and one is spirit, Holy Spirit. Mm -hmm. And the goal is to train your mind to listen to only one of those voices. That's what Jesus was an example of. He heard one voice. He said, be of good cheer, Satan is underfoot. In other words, don't worry about me being tempted by this other voice now. Because I know that this one voice is, is telling me the truth. I'm not confused between the two voices anymore. So. In terms of private thoughts, what that would mean was, is that, imagine Jesus is walking around, he's just sharing, and everything that comes out of his mouth is, is, has the purpose to heal and to comfort and to bless. He's not, he's not got any gossip going. He's not uh, telling the scoop on, you hear about those people over there, and this and this. In fact, he's so open in everything that he shares, that everything that comes from him, is just a blessing for the whole universe. Because he has no private thoughts. He's only sharing thoughts that God is giving him to share. Also, he's very telepathic. You know, you, you look at the Bible and there's a story, remember the story of Jesus and the woman at the well? I've yeah. never read the Bible. Well, th this is another good example when he goes and there's a woman who's at this well and, and uh, uh, I think, I don't know if she's not a Samaritan, she's something other than what he, he, he and his people have been, but she, she comes over and um, she says, you know, would you like some, some water from the well? And he looks at her and he says, drink of me and you will never thirst again. So he's taking it way beyond a sip of water. And then he starts telling her, you know, he says to her, call your husband. And he knows that she's with many men. 
he knows everything about her. There are no private thoughts, but, but he's using them in a gentle, yeah. loving way. He's not there to condemn, but he's like, she, she goes running off. Oh my God, there's a prophet over there by the well. He knows everything about me. You know, he's like reading my mind. And, but the whole story is used to show that there are no private thoughts in the sense that, not that he doesn't pick them up, but that he doesn't believe that they're real. He doesn't condemn them. Or the, there's a story in the Bible about a, a woman, a prostitute, who comes in and, and she falls down to Jesus' feet and she brings out oil and she starts putting oil on his feet and cleaning his feet. And all these <coughs> Sadducees and Pharisees are sitting around condemning this woman. Like, how can he even associate with such a woman? Doesn't he even know, you know how she is and everything? Because like you know, they were taught, you, you just need to be away from these kind of people. Get away from them. You know, they're the sinners. And there Jesus is right there with her. And Jesus is reading all their thoughts in the Bible, you know. And he basically talks about her sincerity and, and her willingness to turn from her ways. That's why she's there. And all these other ones in the room are just condemning, condemning the whole scene. As if he's doing something terribly wrong. And he, he can point that out to them. He, he knows all their thoughts. Not in a condemning way. He wasn't condemning anyone. But his message was, let's not get caught up in these ego private thoughts, because they're not who we really are. They're just fake. Uh, they're, they're imposters. All these thoughts that we're holding on to and believing real are imposters. They're not our real Christ self. So, is that possible? Uh, again, that's inevitable. In other words, as you start to wake up, you know, it must become apparent that none of those private thoughts did any harm or did any real damage and that if you, you thought that they were secret, you held them secret, you were only keeping secrets from yourself, from your true self. And when you wake up, finally you start to see, oh my gosh, I was playing a trick on myself and I did it to myself so I'm glad I could stop doing it and wake up to what's real and true instead of keep blaming the whole private thought thing and the projection thing is to keep you stuck and keep blaming as if somebody else is doing this to me.